Uh, so let me just leave that up for a moment. And I wanted to say uh, something a little bit more about uh, my debt to Bob and to the uh, Sloan Finance Group, including Stuart and uh, Franco and uh, so many other people. Uh, one of the achievements uh, of um, the pioneers of financial economics uh, was they've strode into a morass of complex concepts, ambiguous definitions, and even more ambiguous theories, which was the state of the world in the uh, 50s and 60s and uh, continued and through the revolution, uh, and created a set of definitions, and Stuart's been using them, uh, and we've seen them in the last whole day, that separated the first order essential properties from the second order distractions and made a, uh, ba basically uh, took a lot of the world's complexity away from the analysis and given clear definitions, you can apply logic and sometimes mathematical tools and derive results that can be tracked back to the primitive assumptions. And almost every one of Bob's early papers begins by listing the core assumptions of an indivisible particle, uh, moving continuously but probabilistically through time. And the reader is asked if these assumptions are a decent approximation of the phenomenon she is trying to understand. And for many years of my life, I took them to be a decent approximation. But I am sorry to have had to conclude that the Mertonian axioms don't hold for technologies, which was the phenomenon I was trying to understand. Technologies are highly divisible, so that finding the very unit of analysis is a challenge. Their motion is not observable at scale. It happens in hiding, as it were. You only see the end results. The outcomes are uncertain, but probability distributions are not available through any mechanism that we know. Uh, and the inputs combine in nonlinear ways. And we're, we're used to nonlinearity from option theory, but we're not always so sure how it works. And part of my, what I'm going to talk to you about is, is uh, how I believe it works. And yet, as functioning human beings, uh, we work with technologies all the time, both as generalists and as specialists. We bake cakes, we cook dinner, we program computers, we make automobiles, we build houses, we build skyscrapers, we create platforms that are in fact, as I will argue, portfolios of options. Uh, so there is, I think, a need to bring some definitions to the topic of technology. Let me uh, talk about, we have, I, I would argue we have very few theoretical tools of the caliber that finance as a science gives us to talk about technology. So how do we talk about it? Well, there are kind of two levels. One is down in the weeds, looking at the engineering requirements. Now, the problem is every engineering discipline, and all of us at MIT know that the engineering disciplines have multiplied greatly since the founding of the Institute in the 19th century. They each have a separate language system that doesn't cross over to the other engineering disciplines. Uh, so there's nothing that we can abstract from, or we can abstract, but it's, it's tedious to do it. The other way that is used in economics and management to talk about technologies is you create big categories. So incremental radical incumbent disruptive, narrow purpose, general purpose, physical, digital, those are categorical descriptions. And if you're really lucky, the theorists will give you a two by two. Uh, that is two categories in two dimensions, leading to four basic categories. And that's kind of the state of the art. Um, neither approach helps us to predict when and why different forms of organizations will succeed and fa or fail, and that's my purpose. But I want to say, uh, building on Stuart's presentation, 
if you want to really boggle your imagination, I'm going to argue that there are real options embedded in the very productive systems, the actual production processes, and and and, and uh, uh, you know organizational structures chosen by the firms. So how do you take those? How do those real options, which are numerous and in every company, both mature and and growth, uh, how would you? incorporate those options into an integrated theory of capital structure. That would be quite something. Um, okay, so we cannot, in fact, uh, explain or predict the history of our economy from 1917, when Chandler's big firms were dominant, to 2017, when a whole new set of firms uh, at, at vastly larger market values. You know, why, why are we seeing this transition? Why, are the, why do the market values sort out the way they do? So I'm gonna try to give an explanation based on the theory of real options. My arguments are as follows. Organizations succeed and thus survive by implementing technologies better than rivals. Uh, that's a functional argument. Uh, the function of the organization is to carry out a technology in some fashion that generates value. There are two fundamental types of technologies, step processes and platform systems. Demand, they demand almost opposite forms of organization. So the two fundamental types of technology, uh, step processes, step to step to step to step, but not necessarily in a single order, and platform systems, basically a platform supporting a bunch of options. Just hold these two types in your head as I go through my arguments and, and explain what they are and how they work. So those two uh, uh, types of technologies, notice that they have structure underneath the categories. They're not just, you know it when you see it, uh, categories. Uh, so it's, Operations, distribution, marketing, almost any uh, uh, process requiring management relies on step processes. So step to in the end, a process pops out with some value to users. So step processes are used in transportation, in logistics, in distribution, in marketing, as well as in factories. This is not just a theory of factory production, although Clearly, it was inspired by um, the, the paradigm of mass production that Henry Ford and others developed. Uh, and um, uh, I want to say I'm, I'm associated with a startup, and we're just in the point in our, in our growth where we need to institute some step processes. We can't just uh, let the firm be self-organizing. We're having to specify some things that must happen. So, so this, this conversion to step processes occurs very early, and it was the cause of the genesis of um, uh, schools of management and business. I want to say there are four types of platform systems. This is a cause of great confusion in that part of the academy that studies the new economy. I want to say there are product based platforms, which can be divided into standards-based. Standards-based platforms control cl critical uh, standards, so think Microsoft but also, or, or Apple, but also Z is the standards-based platform for this conference. He's setting the rules, uh, you know, defining the time, defining the slots, defining the authors. Logistical platforms control the flow of goods and services, Think of Amazon, think of container shipping, think of Kelly Nixon and what she's been doing. So, so, so the, to have a successful system, you often need both a standards-based platform and a logistics platform to bring everything together. Uh, but they are different. At the other end, exchange platforms, which um, are sometimes called two-sided markets or n-sided markets, they have two types. You have transaction platforms that produce transactions. So think Alibaba, think Expedia, think Uber. Uh, they have two sides. 
They have, may have more than two sides, but basically they're, they're, they're there to perform the transactions and take a spread, to take a, take a piece of the action. Communication platforms produce information transfers, uh, either um, uh, narrowcast, point to point, or broadcast, so email or, or, or TV. Uh, and think Google search, Facebook, and here very often the core exchange, the core transfer, which is a, a message, um, is, is given for free, and the, the, the platform receives its revenue from some other party like an advertiser. So when they say multiple sides, that's uh, usually a communication platform. Uh, it's the same firm may contain many different types of platforms. Apple, for example, has its operating system, which sets standards. It runs the, dis the manufacturing and distribution system for the iPhone. It has a lot of subcontractors, but that is a logistical platform. It has the iTunes Store and the App Store. Those are uh, transaction platforms. And it has customer reviews of apps and music. That's a communication platform. So any one of those big firms that you saw on the slide of, of you know, 2017, they've got many platforms inside of them. There's a, an unexplored area of what are the complementarities amongst these types of platforms. That has not been investigated. So let's look at step processes. The key thing is that all steps are essential. You leave something out, either the value of the product is less or it fails entirely. So, so you can't skip a step. Uh, strict sequencing isn't necessary. If you think of baking a cake, you have the steps to make the cake, you have the steps to make the icing. Those could go on in parallel, but you've got to do both to have a cake with icing. So think recipe when you think. We can represent the value of a step process as revenue, think, or profit, uh, is a price times a quantity. And quantity, here's where we get into operations theory. The quantity is the minimum capacity, the minimum quantity processed by the set of steps. So the small Qs denote the capacity of the steps. The big Q is the capacity, the throughput of the step process itself. Uh, that's known, if you remember back to uh, MBA days when you took operations, that's known as the production bottleneck. Uh, some of us have read Goldblatt's The Goal, which is about finding the production bottleneck. But this, this is simply a translation of the idea of a production bottleneck into the language of finance. And option theory, because you see the min there, that's, that has an optional. Uh, the other thing to know from reality is that bottlenecks are generally stochastic, so all these cues have little uh, uh, tildes on top of them, uh, and they move around. So, so uh, uh, there's uncertainty here as well as a bottleneck. Owning a step process with random step capacities, this is the real option intuition, is equivalent to shorting a put option on the worst outcome of all the steps. And this got a little mangled in uh, the slide translation, uh, but this is a negative number. Short, the, the value of shorting this put option is a negative number. Now here are the provable properties using um, uh, techniques out of uh, the theory of rational option pricing, but applying it to a different set of options. Provable properties of step processes with random bottlenecks. The more steps, more complexity makes things worse, lowers value. So as you build something out from 10 steps to 100 steps, value goes down. That's the dark side of the wonderful things about the division of labor. More variation, less control of any given step makes things worse also. This creates an environment in which extreme risk aversion to the point of paranoia is probably the right way to approach your problem. 
technology rewards, this technology, this is a technology, this technology rewards prediction and very tight control of all relevant steps. Some of you may have heard of Six Sigma, which is a, a way of managing a step process to have very, very low variation in any given step. It's a, it's a major part of lean production. Uh, and this is simply uh, a, a consequence of, of this proposition based in uh, the properties of shorting a put option. Uh, the more steps, the more severe the problems, and the more control you need. Uh, so, so by the time you get to a semiconductor fab with 2,000 steps, they are managing each step with the tightest controls you can imagine. Uh, piecemeal control cannot address system-wide bottlenecks, so systemic, systematic management requires systemic changes. The people addressing the bottlenecks must be able to roam throughout the system, they must be able to redesign any piece of the work, and they must increase control to reduce variation. Implications for an organization, more control is always better. If you don't control your inputs and outputs, you'll vertically integrate. You want direct authority over the people doing the work because you have to be able to allocate tasks and redefine their jobs. And as these processes get long and large, you're gonna create a managerial hierarchy to, um, uh, to keep the, the to, to make sense, to, 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 uh, uh, to, to, to make the control processes work. Here's the other thing. Technological innovations are by definition risky and thus not welcome unless the risk can be measured and bounded and, and kept under some wraps. So that's step processes. Sounds a lot like those corporations that were large in 1917. U.S. Steel, uh, um, uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, many of what Alfred Chandler called modern corporations. What about platform systems changing? What do the four types of platforms have in common? Why is it okay to talk about all of them as if they're the same thing? Uh, what they have in common is options. Uh, a platform allows users to construct a diverse portfolio of options. So apps on your phone, assets in a retirement account, rides on Uber, friend messages on Facebook. You get to select which of those, which combinations of those things work for you. And so these are all platforms that support the construction of portfolios of options. Uh, platform systems, so, so this is, I hope the, yes, okay. Differences between the two, there's the min going to the max, okay, that's an inversion. And instead of inclusion, as in the step processes, you have addition. So max not min, additive not inclusive, those are the way this, these option structures differ. Uh, and platforms support multiple non-exclusive call options. So when people talk to you about the platform economy, you just say multiple non-exclusive call options. They won't have any idea what you're talking about, but uh, the provable, pro I, I could almost make this a quiz for the room. What are the provable properties of this? Uh, more options are better because options by definition do not threaten the core. Notice that innovations that do threaten the core are not options, so, so you wanna be careful of those. More risk within options are better. Famous theorem of rational option pricing. Indirect network effects, more users pay for more options and more options attract more users. So these platforms all have indirect network effects and modularity, which is splitting up an option into two independent options uh, by another famous theorem of Bob's, modularity gives you more options. A portfolio of options is worth more than an option on a portfolio. 
uh, implications for organization, you want to go where the best options are. Uh, that means you coordinate. You don't necessarily control. You don't, you don't want to drive uncertainty and variation and innovation out. You want more of it. It's open standards, ecosystem, facilitated exchanges. Don't try to tell your users what they want to do. Their creativity is a resource to you, which is not true in a step process. Joy's Law, uh, named after Bill Joy of Sun Microsystems, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. Uh, so you're looking for transient interactions, not permanent relationships. I won't go into the dating analogy. Uh, um, so I'm going to blow by this, but this is just summarizing uh, the differences in what you want in organizations. In terms of organization design, the platform systems are essentially the opposite of the step processes. You want different types of organizations if, you're, if you have both platforms and step processes in the same company as Intel does you will run them very, very differently, and you will have tension between the two. Uh, but steps and platforms are not really opposites because inside every platform and every option, there is a step process. Uh, step processes can be divided into modules, but generally at the cost of lower efficiency. You're gonna have to uh, unstreamline the process, you're going to have to create buffers, inventory, or time, you're going to have to create modular interfaces, so it's not going to work as well as it did. Uh, so you can view a platform with options as a lot of steps separated by modular interfaces and step buffers, like this. So the real question is how many modules and why and where? And I don't know where I am in terms of time as V. Oh, jeez. Uh, you've got 13 minutes. Oh, great. OK. Uh, OK, I'll do this. Uh, so so um, I can make this one of the Q&As. <laughs> you know, it, it is a question that I've teed up. So um, how many people want me to answer this question? Not too many. <laughs> OK. Modules are more valuable when the underlying technologies are changing rapidly. So, so, so remember, the, um, the thought experiment is I've got a bunch of steps, all of which are essential, but I have the opportunity to divide groups of steps into coherent modules and at some cost to separate those modules so that they can be worked on more or less independently and importantly substituted for, replaced, without replacing the whole system. So that's the, that's the thought experiment. And then the question is, when is this a valuable thing to do and to what extent? So here's some, here's some data on the rates of technical change. This data was constructed from some time series out of Santa Fe, uh, plus some of my own research. And the data are very imperfect. There are a bunch of different time series, but you can group them by industry or technology and look at the average of the annual rate of improvement of this type of technology. And so you see that the rates, the, the inherent rates of technical change of various groups of technology are quite different across the spectrum. Many of you have heard of Moore's Law. You can see Moore's Law here in that computers and software have an average rate of technical change on the order of 50% per year. Might be a little lower now, but 50% is the average of the time series that I used. Um, autos, about 10%. Uh, chemicals, six, down to food and energy and metals, which have um, single low single digit rates of technical change in, the, uh, in, in their productivity. Uh, 
Um, so here I've simply calculated on, uh, so, so I've assumed a constant cost of inefficiency for each module buffer uh, of 2% per year. So you, you, if you create the, uh, if, if you split the system in two, you're gonna have one buffer, 2% tax, and so on as you create more, more modules requiring more buffers. Uh, on the horizontal axis is the number of modules, and I have a parameter called A, which is the expected rate of technical change. And here I draw on uh, the analysis in uh, Kim Clark and my book, Design Rules One, which proves that the expected rate of technical change in uh, a, a, a module is um, equivalent to the standard deviation of the um, un underlying, uh, uh, of, of the underlying option. So as the, as, the, as the standard deviation of the option increases, the expected rate of technical change, which is the expectation of that, um, of, of that right, uh, of, of that right hand of the distribution that goes up. Uh, so um, I have uh, put that in. And what you can see is as a function of the number of modules, the values of the processes have in general an inverted U-shape uh, uh, um, shape. And the higher the rate of technical change, so uh, on the top curve, that's the computers uh, and, and software 50%. Uh, the next one is 25%. That's classic of hybrid systems involving some computerized automation, but also some physical processes down to um, uh, 10% and down to, well, down to the very low numbers. Here, let's see if I can, okay, okay I, I, is that what, yes. So this is the high rates of technical change. We don't even at, at uh, uh, 60 modules, we don't get to the peak. Uh, this is 25%, we're at the peak in the, in the 20s, and these processes, uh, if they have a peak, it occurs very early, and for some of them, there's no peak whatsoever. What does this mean? It means that for the low rates of technical change, you're better off just building a long interconnected step process, not trying to modularize it because it's not gonna be that much worthwhile. So optimize those steps, get it to be as efficient as you can because that way you avoid the cost of creating those buffers. So platform systems win for high rates of technical change such as we get for Moore's Law, with Moore's Law, while integrated processes and integrated firms are the correct strategic response when technologies are not changing rapidly and efficiency is the key to success. So that's my wrap up. Real options are embedded in technologies. Our job is to tease them out. Step processes and platform systems have different real option structures, short puts, versus long calls, and you need different organization and management systems to manage these two techno different technological paradigms. Companies often combine the two paradigms, perform some steps, create some platforms that's increasingly uh, the, the modern, what we're seeing in modern times, but in a way, you could use finance science to help you figure out which ones to keep and which ones to let go. Thank you.